A note of warning, this podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast, bringing you this week's latest in high profile and under the radar cases across the country for the week of May 3rd, 2019. I'm Billy Jensen and this is Owen Michael. Hello. This week, a Tennessee man goes on a gruesome murder spree against his family, killing seven people and injuring an eighth. A St. Louis police officer pleads in court after a night of drinking and Russian roulette with a fellow cop goes horribly wrong. And communities are shocked when two different sex offenders in different states get sentences that really do not fit the crimes. But first, an eight-month-old girl is missing in Indianapolis amid suspicious circumstances. What's going on in Indianapolis? This is the case of Amia Robertson. Uh, in Indianapolis, as you said, Amia Robertson is missing. She's an eighth month, excuse me, an eight month old girl who was last seen on March 9th of this year. She was reported missing on March 16th when her mother, Amber Robertson, called police. Amber Robertson called police because she claimed Robert Lyons struck her with his car in an alley behind a babysitter's house in Indianapolis. Amber and Robert were arguing over Amia's whereabouts. So Amber says she handed Amia to Robert, her boyfriend, in the afternoon of March 9th. He says he took the baby to the babysitter's house. And the babysitter reportedly says Amia was never with her that day. So again, we've got one of those discrepancies mm-hmm. where, oh, I, I, dropped, I dropped the kid off. In fact, the babysitter and other witnesses saw Robert leave the house at 1.15 p.m. on the 9th with Amia. Police say Amia's family story has been inconsistent after they first said, Amia was last seen on March 14th and said the baby was not at risk. Two days later, the baby was officially reported missing, having uh, last been seen on the 9th. That's sketchy. On March 19th, police determined the baby may be in danger. An amber alert was never issued, but on the 19th, police issued a silver alert. That silver alert was canceled the next night. An amber alert is issued when there is a specific vehicle information, including license plate numbers. A silver alert is issued for a missing and endangered child, adult, or high-risk missing person. It's an alert when there is far less information that authorities have to work with and share. And we often see silver alerts for um, older older That's people. Usually, what the, what, what I associate that with, which is why I want which is to look dementia that and, and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You usually see it with older people with people dementia. And that's where they've got it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, police serve the White River. Search. Oh, search, excuse yeah. me. Police searched the White River on March 20th for two days after receiving the tip. Mm-hmm. Uh, they found items that belonged to Amia and her family, but did not specify what the items were, according to the Indianapolis Star. But they did declare the case a homicide on March 23rd. The discrepancy on all the dates there is a, kind of a red flag on this thing, for sure. Police searched a third area on the waterfront of a reservoir near the White River on the 25th. Indianapolis Metro Police have visited the babysitter's house three times now as of this week, searching inside the house as well as on the property. This week on Monday, police executed a search warrant at the location. The next morning, they returned with a forensic anthropology team and cadaver dogs, and they dug up the backyard of the house. Police said this week that there were no substantial discoveries from this current search. News outlets reported there were, there were evidence markers at the scene and that police left with multiple evidence bags. The babysitter is reportedly cooperating with police in this investigation. Amber Robertson, uh, Amia's mother, told reporters, I know that she's somewhere out here and she's very scared. I know how scared she is and I want to bring her home. I felt as if my daughter wasn't here, said her mother. So one neighbor, one neighbor told a news crew from Wish TV News 8 that Amber Robertson and Robert Lyons have been living in a car behind the babysitter's house. Police say Robert Lyons has more to tell them about where Amia is. Quote, we believe Mr. Lyons played a part in this baby's disappearance, said the deputy chief of police. Lyons is considered a suspect, but he has not been arrested in connection with the case. Police have asked the, poli- the public in Indianapolis for information on Lyons' activity between March 9th and March 16th, and the FBI has also joined the investigation. Lyons has reportedly told friends and family as well as police, different locations of where Amia should be found. Those locations were checked. Cryptically, police said some of those locations actually don't exist, according to News 8. Mm-hmm. Robert Lyons was arrested for battery for the March 16th incident, where he allegedly hit Amber Robertson with his car. Lyons, who was 20, was jailed, then released on bond. 
Then he was arrested this past Monday night on another warrant on check forgery charges and theft in a different Indiana county. He's accused of cashing fraudulent checks in February and March. Uh, Yes, there's a uh, connection there as well. Robert Lyons is accused of cashing two checks, one's for $125 and the other for $350. Uh, The checks were drawn from an account of a man named Charles Williams III. Uh, Wish TV News 8 reports that both checks had a handwritten phone number on them. Uh, police traced the, the phone number to a friend of Robert Lyons, who, quotes, was also involved in the missing baby case. Williams, the, uh, the, the, the guy whose checks this were, uh, these were, uh, the victim, told police the checks were from old checkbooks that the bank should have canceled a long time ago. Williams has said he, know, he knew Robert Lyons as a kid around the neighborhood, but didn't think Lyons had been in his house. A weird detail, uh, Williams said he does know the person whose phone number was on the checks. The phone number belongs to a woman whom he said had been inside his house to visit a couple of years ago. She had, quote, had attempted to forge paperwork to take his house away from him in the past, according to court documents. Incidentally, at the end of March, uh, Indianapolis Metro Police issued a news release advising caution to the public about donations to this investigation, Mm -hmm. to uh, the investigation, I should say. Uh, Police said, uh, quotes, we'd like to remind the public to use caution when donations are solicited for activities surrounding investigations, such as for search parties. We do not solicit or, uh, for donations in regards to investigations or to assist in area searches. In the same statement, the department went on to clarify that information about uh, the uh, Amia Robertson case would only be released from official channels. So yeah, so they uh, just don't uh, want people because you see that often when somebody goes missing. You, somebody puts up a GoFundMe page. It's a little bit of a grift. Um, it usually, for the most part. It, 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 the intentions are good. They need money. They sure. need money for dogs. They need money for um, uh, vehicles. They need money for sonar searches. But um, in a case, you know, attend, you know, there's always a case where this could be bad. I'm, so. un- I'm unaware of when a, a law enforcement agency themselves would go seek funding. You know, you can see the yeah. family would be like, you know, we no, need, it's usually that's usually to, the family or we friends, have people yeah. helping us out or whatever the case is. But there's a lot of uh, weird incons- inconsistencies here as far as you know, the dates of when the child has actually gone missing and, and all this ancillary stuff. Yeah. So it's a, it's a strange case, and uh, I, I, we can only hope for the best that the, the girl will be found yeah. somewhere. And soon. we'll have updates on this case at, uh, at True Crime Daily and also on uh, the Facebook True Crime Daily page. So As always. Now we're going to Nashville for uh, Michael Cummins. Last weekend, seven people were found dead and an eighth person was injured in or around two separate houses about an hour away from Nashville, Tennessee. Police responded to a 911 call at a house near the Kentucky state line on Saturday and found four people dead and one injured person. A fifth person was found killed in another home not far away, according to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigations. Then on Sunday, TBI said two more bodies were found in the first house. The deaths are considered related homicides. That's a quote. Investigators identified Michael Cummins, 25, as a suspect, and a search was launched. TBI search aircraft spotted Cummins in a creek bed about a mile from the first house. At least 12 SWAT team personnel tracked him down, and the situation escalated, according to TBI, and at least one officer shot Cummins. Cummins was hospitalized with a non-threatening life, um, non-life-threatening injury, and no officers were injured. So on Monday, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation identified the victims as related to Michael Cummins, including his father, his mother, his uncle, who were all found dead at the first location <clears throat> inside of house. The injured victim in, excuse me, the injured victim is an unspecified relative and was listed in critical condition. She may be Cummins' grandmother, according to family members, so that's not confirmed just yet. The three others found dead at the first house were identified, but their relation to Michael Cummins was not immediately known. They include a 43-year-old woman, that woman's 12-year-old daughter, and the woman's 65-year-old mother, all dead. Mm -hmm. Authorities said the scene at the first house was so gruesome that it took extra time to find each body, not finding the last two bodies until the next day. That's crazy. That's That's hard to imagine. The person found dead at the second location was a 69-year-old woman who has no known relationship to Michael Cummins. That location is less than a mile from the first scene. This particular victim's vehicle had been taken. Uh, Witnesses said uh, Michael Cummins was seen driving that car, later found abandoned. Those witnesses said Cummins was wearing a white shirt with blood stains on it. They say he told them, quotes, if anything goes down, he would get blamed for it, and he was saving a bullet for himself, according to court records. 
CBS News reports that Michael Cummins was days away from being arrested for probation violations. His probation officer was preparing an arrest warrant last Friday. Now, Cummins was on probation for trying to burn down a neighbor's house in 2017, then assaulting the woman when she tried to put out the fire. He had stuffed garbage in between insulation and floorboards of the house and lit the material on fire. The neighbor said Cummins had a revolver in his hand during the attack, and he reportedly told a sheriff's deputy, quote, If I get out of jail, I'll go there and do it again. When I get out, I'll finish the job. The neighbor is not one of the victims in this weekend's mass murder. She told the Tennessean she lived in fear of Cummins, who constantly terrorized her, even after being released from jail. He pleaded guilty to aggravated assault and attempted arson in 2018. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison, but after pleading guilty in a plea agreement, he was released in January after serving 16 months, which is ridiculous, and was sentenced to probation for 10 years. He has other charges on his record, record including theft, assault, and drugs charges. Yeah, I should say that uh, when he pleaded guilty, he was already serving time, and he had agreed to this plea agreement, which let them, they gave him an extra 180 days, then released him and, and on probation. But, uh, yeah, there's some red flags here for sure. Uh, the David uh, Davidson County Medical Examiner said that all seven people killed were homicide victims. Their causes of death included multiple blunt force injuries and some sharp force injuries. The TBI director said the crime scenes were gruesome and horrific. A uh, gun was reportedly not used in, in these. Uh, the crime is the deadliest homicide event in Tennessee in all, at least 20 years, according to the TBI. The probation violation says Cummins contacted the neighbor whose house he had tried to burn down against a no-contact order. Cummins had also not followed through on court-ordered mental health evaluation and treatment and had missed appointments with his probation officer. Probation officer was not able to get a judge's signature by the end of the day, Friday. The next day, Cummins allegedly went on his murder spree. Ah. The Sumner County District Attorney said as of Wednesday, Cummins had still not been served his arrest warrant for the murders because he was still hospitalized after being shot. He was, however, listed in good condition earlier this week. A neighbor had told WTVF News Channel 5 in Nashville that Michael Cummins, uh, quote, terrorized our neighborhood for forever. Break-ins, they've stole four-wheelers, lawnmowers, they've stole anything they could get their hands on. Yeah, so I think there's going to be a lot of questions here. The um, not being able to get the judge's signature. Ugh, that's, that's rough. That's rough. And that's got away on the judge. Uh, not being able, you know, you know, the plea deal, the original plea deal, and how violent this guy was. The, 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 the statements about, uh, you know, I'll, I'll come back and finish the job and that kind of thing uh, definitely will raise some red flags yeah. there. Even the, the TBI director, though, as they said, uh, you can't predict what people are going to do, as, as in you can't blame the, the probation officer or the judge or anything like mm. this. So, like nobody expects that uh, this is going to happen. However, this is one of those worst case scenarios that uh, given a difference. See, the thing is, you can you kind of protect, uh, predict what someone's going to do when he says, if I get out of jail, I'll go there and I'll do it again. When I get out, I'll finish the job. That's kind of a prediction that he gave. And that's something that we should have taken more seriously. Should, uh, uh, take somebody at their word when, they, mm -hmm. when they're acting like that, yeah. uh, especially when he's been released and he's uh, going around. Exactly. To, uh, so it's all, it's, all, it's all about accountability here. It's all about yeah. you know, what we do with violent offenders. We have so many nonviolent offenders in prison for things sure, like drugs is. and um, uh, uh, you know, uh, solicitation and things like that. And we don't have... Uh, uh, you know, they're, they're sitting in prison, criminalized, mm -hmm. and this guy gets out in 16 months after doing that and after pledging to do it, you know, finish the job. No, it, for, me, for me, it's unacceptable. So uh, we're going to go to St. Louis now. Caitlin Alex, a police officer in St. Louis. And there's some questions about this case. Um, but we want to know, definitely know what you, what you, what you all think of this. A St. Louis police officer pleaded not guilty to first degree manslaughter and armed criminal action this week in the shooting death of another officer. Caitlin Alex was a 24-year-old St. Louis Metropolitan Police officer in the early morning hours of January 24th of this year. Police were called to an apartment in South St. Louis on a report of an accidental shooting. Caitlin Alex was found shot in the chest. She was off duty. A probable cause statement says St. Louis police officer Nathaniel Hendren, 29, was on duty with his partner, and they were both at the apartment. It was Nathaniel Hendren's apartment. Caitlin Alex was at the apartment. The St. Louis Circuit Attorney said Hendren and Alex were playing with a revolver when Alex was shot in the chest. Investigators 
said the two were playing a variation of Russian roulette. They were allegedly drinking alcohol and taking turns pointing a gun loaded with one bullet at each other and pulling the trigger. KTVI Fox 2 reports that uh, Hendren's partner on duty was also present at the time. Hendren and his partner rushed Alex, uh, Caitlin Alex to a hospital where she was pronounced dead from her chest wound at 1.07 a.m. Hendren and his partner were reportedly drinking, and the apartment is outside of the area that they were supposed to be patrolling in, a different police, in, uh, in an entirely different police district. Hendren's partner was not charged with a crime. He was placed on administrative duty, however. News reports say he left the room uh, during this incident. Uh, he was uncomfortable with the gunplay, but he heard yeah. the gunshot from the next room. St. Louis Post-Dispatch reports that uh, Nathaniel Hendren and his partner skipped a call for a burglary alarm uh, right. and asked other officers to cover it while they were at his house, which is about six miles away from that incident. As we said, Caitlin Alex died from her chest wound. Yeah, so Hendren was held on house arrest after posting bail. An arrest photo of Nathaniel Hendren shows a huge black eye and cuts on his forehead. You can see it at True Crime Daily or on our Facebook page. He reportedly shattered the back window of a police SUV with his head when he was at the hospital. He was treated at that hospital where he was then arrested. Alex was married to another St. Louis police officer. They were married last October. And he was not at the apartment the night of the shooting. Alex Hendren and his partner that night were known to be friends uh, with each other and frequent partners on patrol. Caitlin Alex had been on the force for two years, as was Hendren's partner. Hendren himself has one year of service. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch, quoting court documents, puts the events like this. The three officers met up at uh, Hendren's place sometime before 1 a.m., Hendren unloaded a revolver, then put one bullet back in. He spun the cylinder, pointed it away, and pulled the trigger. Didn't fire. Alex uh, then took the gun. Caitlin Alex took the gun, pointed it at Hendren, and pulled the trigger. Didn't fire. Hendren then took the gun back again, pointed at Alex, and pulled the trigger. This time it fired, striking her in the chest. Caitlin Alex and Nathaniel Hendren both served in the military before joining the police force. KMOV News 4 reported on a court document... Uh, it said Hendren at the hospital, quote, spontaneously stated to his supervisor that he did not try and kill the victim because he was in love with her and they were in an intimate relationship and were planning on moving into his apartment. Nathaniel Hendren is scheduled to appear in court on June 17th. Yeah. So obviously there's a there's a lot of speculation that's going on. The police have said, listen, let's let us finish this uh, investigation before anybody comes to any conclusions about what was actually going on that night. 1 a.m., um, I haven't seen anything about uh, any, if any substances were being used, any drinking was going on, but uh, 1 a.m. with a handgun. You know. I mean, it, 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 it feels a little bit, uh, as we say, it's a conjecture, but it feels a little bit like thrill-seeking behavior. Uh, you know, people that play with guns this way, you're drinking, you're a military background, you're cops. I mean, no disrespect for anybody in the armed services or in law enforcement. Um, but this is a, uh, this is not an unusual, uh, situation mm-hmm. necessarily. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Uh, and I'm just talking about the details itself. This, uh, it's, it's yeah, a no, dangerous it, situation. It, and, it, it, it and, is. And, uh, it's kind of thrill seeking behavior. Uh, I, you've I, got uh, uh, an alleged affair. You've got uh, alleged drinking while on the job uh, as far as the, the playing around with guns and that kind of thing. I mean, who, who does that? That's, yeah. uh, that's as we say, we'll, we'll, we'll find out more details. No, about we it, definitely have to. We a, can't make any uh, any assumptions or anything like that. We're just going to wait for the investigation. What we're hoping, you know, you're hoping is, is that inter- internal affairs gets involved, you know, because the only other uh, uh, witness is this guy's partner mm-hmm. who was in the other room. He doesn't know exactly what was going on. He doesn't know what that conversation was but um you know you take it at face value at first but then you always got to investigate and see you know what exactly was going on and whether this was an accident or whether it was actually malicious so mm-hmm. uh, uh just you know bottom line of shared uh, a sad story all around and we go from a sad story to an infuriating story out of new york indeed shane pishi He's a 26-year-old former school bus driver in upstate New York. He will not serve jail time after pleading guilty to third-degree rape of a 14-year-old girl. Uh, he, now, uh, he was a driver in Watertown, New York. This girl uh, was on his bus route. Pichy is accused of maintaining a relationship with the girl, bringing her to his apartment and giving her alcohol, then raping her. He allegedly provided two more, uh, other minors alcohol. Now, the New York State Supreme Court judge sentenced Pichy to 10 years probation. He must 
register as a level one sex offender and pay court fees of fifteen hundred bucks. A level one sex offender is considered low risk of reoffense. It's the lowest level status of sex offender in New York. He won't be required to list his address in online sex offender databases, just his zip code. And although prosecutors could have requested up to four years in prison, they recommended PC spend six months in jail, not prison, followed by probation. Prosecutors <clears throat> wanted to protect the teen victim from court proceedings, is what they're saying. Pishi was originally charged with second-degree rape, but prosecutor, prosecutors offered him the lesser charge because he was willing to plead guilty. He has had no prior arrests. The New York Post quotes a statement from the victim's mother, quotes, I wish Shane Pishi would have received time in jail for the harm he caused to my child. He took something from my daughter she will never get back and has caused her to struggle with depression and anxiety. PC's lawyer told WWNY7 News, quotes, he'll be a felon for the rest of his life. He's on the sex offender registry for a long time. Maybe not the rest of his life because of, the, excuse me, maybe not the rest of his life because of this level, but this isn't something that didn't cause him pain, and this isn't something that didn't have consequences. Yeah, okay. Right. Uh, this case has caused outrage across the country with petitions seeking the recall of New York State Supreme Court Judge James McCluskey. And this immediately draws comparisons to the Stanford University mm -hmm. case of Brock Turner in California, who was convicted of sexually assaulting a woman outside a fraternity house. If you remember, the woman was passed out. Mm -hmm. He was assaulting her. These, I think they were exchange students or guys from Sweden or something came along. They stopped it. It was behind a dumpster yeah. behind a Be thing. I mean, it's just the, yeah, it's behind so a dumpster. This was yeah, and the of course the the press were, were calling him a swimmer from Stanford, mm -hmm. not a rapist. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he was. Uh, Supreme Court Judge Aaron Persky sentenced Turner to six months in jail. Superior Court, I should Superior say. Superior Court. Uh, Supreme. Turner served three months before he was released, and Persky was ultimately recalled by voters in California. So we're, uh, there is a groundswell of support for doing the yeah, same thing. Yeah, six judge. months in jail, and then you only serve three months anyway, and, you know, yeah. it's it's awful. Uh, uh, Brock Turner eventually moved back to Ohio, and he has to register as a sex offender, et cetera kind of ruined his swimming career and his college career but uh, my god what the what the hell is uh, yeah. is, is up with that that's uh, yeah no, he's, he's a piece of garbage and the fact that um that he, he was able to skate for this you you would hope that and when you saw this happen uh to his judge and his judge got recalled you would hope that every other judge would be like you know what i gotta start taking Warning these sign. seriously and yeah. Well, <clears throat> this Shane Pichy case, this is pretty far upstate to uh, New York. Uh, you know, it's a smaller community. As I, some spokesman, spokesperson for the for the prosecutor's office said something along the lines of, "We can never anticipate how the public is going to." Um, you know react what? To some I, of our I cases. could anticipate how the public feel like react that, to this. That could have been. Uh, yeah. That could have been foreseen. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I, I, they're definitely feeling some heat uh, this yeah. week. Well, you know what? This isn't the only case of that this week. We got another one out of Atlanta. What's going on with uh, with this guy? This uh, very similar situation here that might raise your blood pressure a little bit. A week ago Thursday, a 33-year-old Georgia man named Michael Wislavsky pleaded guilty to first-degree cruelty to children and interstate interference with custody. He was sentenced to 10 years in jail with eight months to serve. He was already held for eight months prior to his court date, so he got credit for time served, eight months. He serves the rest of his time, nine years and four months, on probation. He also must register as a sex offender. Uh, the details are uh, a little upsetting here. Wislowski uh, kept a teenage girl as a sexual slave for more than a year in the Atlanta area. And the details and there's are, definitely uh, trigger ahead. warnings here mm -hmm. uh, coming up. So on an online forum for people with anorexia, this guy... Wyshlovsky, he meets this girl who's 15 at the time. So obviously he's trolling for mm -hmm. people with anorexia. You know, he, he's looking for the weakness. Twice her age. Yes. Uh, she's uh, living in Charlotte, North Carolina. When she turns 16 in May of 2016, she runs away from home and comes to live with him uh, because 16 is the age of consent in Georgia. So he waits for that. So mm. he's grooming her. Mm. Wyshlovsky had reportedly convinced her to come live with him. He drove the four hours to Charlotte and picked her up on the side of the interstate highway. Investigators say the two entered in a, into a consensual, this is quote, consensual, non-consensual BDSM relationship. But Wyshlovsky then forced it further, sexually abusing her, keeping her in a dog cage and controlling her food. 
The girl made contact online with a woman on another anorexia forum who contacted the authorities. She told the woman she had been reported missing and sent her a picture from the room where she was being held captive in a floor-to-ceiling grate because she wasn't sure where she was. And then that woman contacted the FBI. The victim was rescued at age 17 after, this, uh, after she reached out. When federal agents raided Wyslowski's house, she was malnourished. She had ringworm. Yeah. She had back problems from staying in this dog cage. Wyslowski couldn't be charged with child molestation due to George's age of consent, but he was char- charged with child cruelty, which applies to 17 years and younger. As part of a plea deal, prosecutors dropped rape and sodomy charges because they say the charges would have been hard to prove due to issues with consent. As well, they would have had to go to trial, and the victim and her family did not want right. that to happen. In court, Michael Wyslowski told the judge that he thought he had been, uh, quote, helping the victim escape from a bad home life. The judge said, quote, uh, I can't see even the most twisted definition of what you did as help. I don't see any emotion from you. I don't see any remorse. Yeah. And um, again, with these plea deals, I understand that they didn't want to go to trial. Um, uh, the girl did not want to testify. And the defense attorneys know this. Mm-hmm. And they're just waiting there, waiting. You know, the, it becomes a waiting game and waiting it out and just being like, listen, you know what? All we got to do is just wait. We're going to get a plea deal because we know the family doesn't want to go through with it. The defense attorney is on record saying that he won't accept any jail time beyond the, the time served. So that's that was yeah. the, the hill that they were going to die on as far as uh, this. And it appears to have worked out in his favor. I mean, he's still being punished and he's sentenced, but uh, it does not seem to uh, represent the gravity of the crime. No, it certainly doesn't. And, you know, as you know, we, we try to give, you know, this was a very heavy week. There's a lot of heavy stories there. That's true. Um, but we read your comments, and we had, uh, we had a lot of comments on our Facebook page. Again, True Crime Daily has the largest True Crime Facebook page in the world. Check it out. And um, this one that came out of PIX11, rapper Remy Ma was charged with assault for punching love and hip-hop star Brittany yes. Taylor, said New the York police. City. New York City, rapper Remy Ma was charged with assault. She turned herself into police. She allegedly punched the reality star in the face at Irving Plaza in New York City. Who are these people again? We've got rapper Remy Ma and Mm -hmm. uh, what's the other one? Love and Hip Hop, which is a reality TV show. Indeed, I haven't caught it recently. And, um, you know, there is a a lot of comments on this story. Um, We've got about uh, 3,000 shares, 2,000... Emotion faces, happy faces, or whatever, and more than a thousand comments. Uh, yeah, people had strong feelings about Delia this. Delia R said, "Just for a punch in the face, SMH, free Remy Ma. This justice is so messed up for Predator. They give them probation. Like I don't understand." So she's going back. This is she's she's going back to the yeah, cases that we were just talking about. Mm-hmm. So she's she's a reader. Uh, I know for a fact she had done. Um, she had to do something to punch to receive that punch in the face. Well, you know what? You can't just go around punching people in the face. It's illegal. It is illegal. Um, let's see. Uh, she provoked Remy Ma. Uh, Olivia S said because she knew she was on probation, she should punch her in both of her eyes. Again, you can't it's punch not, people. Uh, that's in like the some eye. sort of biblical. Yeah. Uh, Sharita F says, "I'm sorry. I'm not a scary woman, but I wouldn't mess with a chick I know who has shot somebody before." LOL. Uh, the, mm. And it just goes uh, on and on. Remy, need, you know, um, uh, Shalomi P says Remy needs to make better decisions. She just had a baby. She's on parole. Why would you put yourself in that position again? Uh, again, we don't know what happened. We don't know why there was a fight. Sometimes people step up to people, and you just don't know what's going Sometimes on. Sometimes things are good for ratings and uh, selling albums, but uh, uh, selling uh, albums or selling, you know, uh, somebody that is, uh, you know, on a reality show and continually, you know, wanting to boost up their career more and getting having your name How mentioned cynical, with Remy Ma is what a cynical potentially take on this, uh, something something that you'd want to do. So we're not passing judgment on anybody, but uh, we'll let the authorities figure it out. But again, um, uh, you've got some stuff that uh, you're promoting uh, uh, lately. Did, have you thought about uh, getting into kind of I have not thought about getting into a, a fight. rage uh, situation? Something what, like that? what celebrities TMZ. have I seen potentially out and about that I... Um, that I could get into a fight with. I don't, I haven't really seen that many. No. Like I saw Chelsea, Chelsea Handler, oh, who yeah. actually her book came out two days before my book. So I love me some Chelsea Handler. Yeah. I think she so would I probably, could have started a fight. She would probably she, take she me would, Yeah. She's, yeah, she's uh, from your part of the country pretty, too. She's pretty badass. Um, she would probably uh, dish it out. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, no, I did not do that. I preferred to, um, 
to be the, the gentle uh, the gentle type when it comes to my promotion. As people know so. you, the gentle type. Also, if you have comments or questions about the show, call us up and leave a message at 888-548-9758. We'd love to hear from you in your own voice. The advisor recording may be aired on uh, any of our future podcasts. Check out our content on YouTube and Facebook and truecrimedaily.com. And don't forget to download our weekly podcast on Stitcher, on iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. So until next week, this is True Crime Daily, the podcast reminding you... Don't do crimes. See you next week.